Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. This particular installment is one of a group in which I'm addressing the rise of individualism, urbanization, and industrialization in relation to some literary texts from the first half of the 20th century. Here, I'll be discussing Richard Wright's short story, The Man Who Was Almost a Man. Like many works from this period, this is a typical Bildungsroman, a story of the coming of age of a young person. In this case, the protagonist is an African-American teenager, and the story is set in the Deep South. The story is written in free, indirect discourse. Wright narrates with a third-person voice, using substantial dialogue, but the perspective is clearly that of Dave, the protagonist. Wright keeps the settings and the characters relatively underdeveloped, emphasizing Dave's relationship to the larger society and its institutions. Dave's aspirations and the conditions that limit him are represented in symbols such as the catalog, the gun, the mule, and the railroad. Like other texts of the late modern period, this story develops characteristic themes of high modernism on two levels. On the one hand, the text celebrates individualism with some ambivalence. Dave achieves his freedom, although he does not quite achieve maturity. At the same time, the text presents an implicit critique of modern society. The text is critical of the constraints that limit Dave and other individuals. This fusion of two themes can be seen even in the title, The Man Who Is Almost a Man. On the one hand, Dave is a boy who is impatient to be a man. He chafes under his subordination to his parents, to the white man he works for, Mr. Hawkins, to other white people he encounters, and to the older black men with whom he works in the fields. I think the title also glances at the common practice in the Jim Crow South of white people addressing adult black men as boy. This form of address is calculated to support and maintain a system of white supremacist racial hierarchy and it was an experience of disrespect in the daily lives of most black men. With that historical framework in mind, now let's look at an early passage that establishes Dave's motives and desires. Dave struck out across the fields, looking homeward through paling light. What's the use talking with them in the field? Anyhow, his mother was putting supper on the table. Them can't understand nothing. Notice how the author shifts from exposition delivered in third-person voice, but clearly from Dave's perspectives, interspersed with a direct presentation of Dave's inner feelings and thoughts. The passage continues. One of these days, he was going to get a gun and practice shooting. Then they couldn't talk to him as though he were a little boy. He slowed, looking at the ground. Shucks, I ain't scared of them even if they are bigger than me. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going by old Joe's store and get that Sears Roebuck catalog and look at them guns. Maybe Ma will let me buy one when she gets my pay from old man Hawkins. I'm going to beg her to give me some money. I'm old enough to have a gun. I'm 17. Almost a man. This motif of striving to prove one's manhood under hostile circumstances is developed progressively throughout the story as Dave acquires a gun then accidentally shoots his boss's mule and attempts to cover up his accident by inventing a story that the mule has died after falling on the plow point and finally faced with the harsh consequence of having to work for two years simply to pay for the dead mule Dave decides to run away presumably to the big city. I want to look at the dialogue between Dave and his mother in which he persuades her to let him buy the gun. What's interesting to me is the way that she seems to recognize instinctively how her husband is infantilized by not having a gun in this society in which gun ownership is an essential part of masculinity. 
Dave is in the kitchen with his mother, and she's washing dishes. He opens the catalog to the page where the guns are shown, and he says, Ma, God knows I want one of these. One of what? she asked, not raising her eyes. One of these, he said again, not daring even to point. She glanced up at the page, then at him, with wide eyes. Has you gone plumb crazy? Aw, oh, Ma, get out of here. Don't you talk to me about no gun. You're a fool. Ma, uh, I can buy one for two dollars. Not if I knows it, you ain't. But you promised me one. I don't care what I promised. You ain't nothing but a boy yet. Ma, if you let me buy one, I'll never ask you for nothing no more. I told you to get out of here. You ain't going to touch a penny of that money for no gun. That's how come I had Mr. Hawkins to pay your wages to me. Because I knows you ain't got no sense. But Ma, we need a gun. Pa ain't got no gun. We need a gun in the house. You never can tell what might happen. She was stacking the plates away. Her hands moved slowly, reflectively. Dave kept an anxious silence. Finally, she turned to him. I'll let you get that gun if you promise me one thing. What's that, Ma? You bring it straight back to me, you hear? It be for Pa. Guns are traditional symbols of masculine power and in a society in which gun ownership is taken for granted for adult men. It's significant that Dave's father doesn't own a gun. So when Dave asks his mother for permission to buy a gun, she finally persuades herself that it is okay with the justification that Dave's father needs a gun. Later in the story, after having gotten the gun, and having accidentally killed his boss's mule, Dave steals away from home, retrieves the gun, and stands on the brink between the humiliation and constrainment of home and the freedom of the outside world. I'll read a few passages from the ending. He clutched the gun stiff and hard in his fingers, but as soon as he wanted to pull the trigger, he shut his eyes and turned his head. Nah, I can't shoot with my eyes closed and my head turned. With effort, he held his eyes open. Then he squeezed. Bloom. He was stiff, not breathing. The gun was still in his hands. Damn it, he'd done it. He fired again. Bloom. He smiled. Bloom. Bloom. Click. Click. There. It was empty. If anybody could shoot a gun, he could. He put the gun into his pocket and started across the fields. When he reached the top of a ridge, he stood straight and proud in the moonlight looking at Jim Hawkins' big white house, feeling the gun sagging in his pocket. Lord, if I had just one more bullet, I'd take a shot at that house. I'd like to scare old man Hawkins just a little, just enough to let him know Dave Saunders is a man. In a sense, Dave does achieve his manhood with his gun, but in a comically reductive sense. He shoots not to threaten his boss, the white man, Jim Hawkins, but instead, he accidentally shoots Jim Hawkins' mule. One ironic way of interpreting this in the context of the white supremacist hierarchy of the Jim Crow South is to say that for that system, Dave was a man when compared to a mule, but not fully a man when compared to a white man. Faced with the prospect of working for free for two more years, Dave instead runs away from home. The cars slid past, steel grinding upon steel. I'm riding you tonight, so help me God. He was hot all over. He hesitated just a moment, then he grabbed, pulled the top of a car, and lay flat. He felt his pocket. The gun was still there. Ahead, the long rails were glinting in the moonlight, stretching away, away to somewhere, somewhere where he could be a man. I find this ending somewhat ambivalent and somewhat ominous. Dave has achieved his independence, his transition to manhood. But his notion of manhood has more to do with the exercise of power than with achieving maturity or accepting responsibility. As he climbs on top of the freight car, he checks to see that he still has his gun. He's a young man embarking upon his journey into the wider world, and he's armed, and he may be dangerous. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But if you have questions or comments, send me an email.